temple style and form in Brahms, lecture two. Uh, to, last time we talked about tempo and how to read uh, Brahms's markings, uh, just how to understand them. Uh, today we move on to different ways of actually interpreting them. And also just generally to other questions pertinent to how we should play his music or how we might be able to play his music. That today we talk about style and style means first of all performance practice. Okay, what is performance practice? It comes from that German fancy term Aufführungspraxis, but really it's a way of thinking about how music was supposed to be performed and is supposed to be performed, whether it's music of the past or music of the present. So, of course, uh, that we think of performance practice relating to Bach and relating to music of the Baroque and just far away music. Uh, and of course that's very applicable, but you know, you guys know more about it than, than you may think, even those of you who don't feel you know that much because we have to deal with issues of performance practice all the time. I want to give you some examples that all of you will know. Uh, for example, uh, we have this, uh, Brandenburg 5. If you look at this first page of the last movement, what is the obvious thing we need to know about how to perform this? Anybody can tell me? Just go ahead and mute if you if you have an answer. What is the obvious thing in this in this piece? The obvious thing is, I don't know if I can see all of you, but the obvious thing is that these dotted rhythms cannot be played uh, as dotted rhythms. They have to be played as triplets. Right? They have to be played in Baroque style together with the triplets, otherwise n this movement doesn't make any sense. So when you play Bach, you need to know that in this situation, performance practice suggests, uh, demands that we play the triplets as, excuse me, the dotted rhythms as triplets. Here's another example. This is just a random Bach chorale. In this chorale, look at all the fermatas, one in the first stave and then, what, two, three, four of them in the next stave. What does that mean? They don't really mean fermatas. What does that mean in the Bach chorale? Anybody know? You guys sing Bach chorales ever? I hope you do. Avery mm -hmm. has an opinion, please. Um, it's uh, where, where, you, where they breathe. Exactly. Not just they, but we, if we sing it, any of us. But yes, it's a breath. It's a, it's, it's a breath mark, it's sometimes a phrase mark, but it certainly is not a fermata in the way that 50 or 100 years later a fermata is meant in music. It's just a breath mark. Okay, and another example. This is from St. Matthew Passion. Uh, can somebody tell me what the numbers are, the funny numbers above the bass note? What is that called? Figured bass. Very good. Figured bass. Okay, so figured bass means that we have to play certain harmonies indicated by the numbers. And also, we have to know that sometimes we play chords, sometimes we play arpeggiated chords, sometimes we fill in with passage work. All of that is part of performance practice. So, these are obvious examples. And if we move on to other composers, um, it's just something you don't think about. But you see that in a, here's a Mozart minuet from K284. I mean, you play the repeats, then you play the second minuet, and then what happens at the bottom of the second page? Now, that's not even Mozart, that's supplied by the editors. DC, what does DC mean? Well, we all know DC is da capo. And da capo means from the head, from the top, from the beginning, right? And so we all know that actually when you play a classical minuet, the tradition is, the performance practices, we go back. And now Zach is here, and see, I don't know how to let him in without... Can I give somebody control over this? Is there a simple way to do that, to, to let in? Does anybody know how to do that quickly? Maybe you could make someone host. Yeah, where do I do that on a Mac? Uh, you, you hover of, over their screen, over their camera, or over their image, sorry. <laughs> then you press the three ellipses. And then okay, think, you know what, Nathan, you sound like a good candidate for that. If I can find you, if I can find you in here. Uh, <laughs> Where did you go? I'm here. Uh, oh, there you are. Yeah. 
three dots. Okay, that's not going to mess up the recording. I hope not. Uh, I hope not. Let's find out. Sure. Okay, you're the host. Now let in whoever wants to come in. Sure. Thank you very much. So, uh, as I'm saying, this uh, the, the capo is something we know about. And then here's another example. It's so obvious we don't think of it, but uh, what is that uh, fermata here in a second staff? Five bars, seven bars from the end. What are we supposed to do there? The editor helps us, but that's not Beethoven's words. Cadenza, right? It's not just a fermata. We know when there's a big 6-4 chord near the end of a classical concerto first movement to play a cadenza. That's also performance practice. These examples are so obvious that we don't really think of being, um, you know, particularly smart to know that, but that's part of how we deal with those composers. So now as we move on to Brahms, things are not as obvious, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we still have to interpret notation in certain ways. So look at the violin concerto here. What is that PF in the beginning of the very first bar on this screen? Anybody know what that means, PF? Some kind of a special effect? A kind of reverse accent, some people say. First you play piano, then you play suddenly forte instead of forte. You know, no, it's not. It's not anything like that. You have to know that a PF in Brahms means poco forte. Poco forte. Now, if we rewind to last week's class, we know that poco means a little bit. Of course, you knew that before last week, I hope. So poco just means a little bit forte. And so, again, we have to know Brahms to know that poco forte then is actually a very modest dynamic. It's not forte. It's not probably even mezzo forte. Usually, poco forte is approximately mezzo piano in Brahms. In other words, it's only a little bit of the way from piano to forte. So if you start that journey from here to here, just a little bit of the way, that's poco forte. So it's a round mezzo piano. That's what the PF means. Okay? Or another example. Uh, can someone tell me the third staff, the third system of music? There's a quarter note equals half note. What does that mean? Like, okay, I mean, I can read it, but what does it mean if we're playing it? The tempo becomes twice as slow. So the quarter note is which one? And the half note is which one? The quarter note is the previous tempo and the, the half note is the new tempo. And so you would think, but it's exactly the opposite. Uh, oh. Because that's how it's marked these days, in the last 100 years approximately. So that's a very good, very good guess and a, and a logical guess. But that's not how Brahms wrote it, or indeed most composers. Uh, who, who wrote that sort of thing. The new quarter note of that 6-4 in the third uh, system equals the old half note, which means it's half tempo. The pulse ends up being half as fast or twice as slow, if you prefer. So those are just some examples that performance practice comes into Brahms as well. Okay, style more generally. Okay, what is style? I had actually started thinking about it. I looked in a dictionary just to see, well, what is a diction? Not a music dictionary, just an English dictionary. What does style mean? Okay, here are some definitions. A manner of doing something that fits us very well. What is the st our style of playing Bach, Brahms, uh, John Cage, whatever. Okay, or a way of painting, writing, composing, building, let's say, you know, characteristic of a particular period, place, person, movement, a movement in music, a movement in art, again, that fits very well. And then I even like that next definition, a distinctive personal appearance. And of course, we're thinking here primarily distinctive to Brahms. But it's also a little bit to each one of us, of course, because each one of us has his or her own distinctive personal appearance and distinctive personal flavor and language and taste. And that, of course, comes into style. But we're most interested in how we can fit the style, first and foremost, of the composer. So, uh, how can we find out what the style of Brahms was? Of course, it's conjecture. It's conjecture. We cannot be certain about anything. Uh, except, you know, we can barely be certain we're all here together right now. 
and you know this is reality but we don't really know except of what's right in front of us what's real and what isn't uh, so the best way with Brahms is to look at his students his contemporaries his friends uh, people who knew him who played for him who played with him and uh, of those people uh, the most important uh, maybe is Clara Schumann uh, and you know about Clara but then the other maybe even more important for Brahms uh, is Joseph Joachim. Joachim, I have his dates, who, who is there, every violinist of course knows Joachim, great violinist, great violin teacher, an important composer at the time, although we don't remember his music very much anymore, teacher, writer, all of those things. He was part of Brahms's closest circle for decades and decades, back from their friendship with Schumann in the early days. Uh, Joachim, of course, gives the premiere of the violin concerto, and not not only gives the premiere, but helps Brahms to to write some of the violin passages. When Brahms says, "Is this going to work? What about this fingering? Is this playable? What about these fourths? Uh, uh, how is this going to work? Uh, is it is it manageable?" And certain bow techniques, and and so Joachim helps with all of this. And he comes, as I said, from Schumann. He comes from Mendelssohn, and this is this proper. Uh, style of the German school and Joachim himself already in the 1880s so look he's born in 1831 he's already complaining that these new Franco-Belgian school of violin players in particular people like Vuitton right you ask your violin friends they're always practicing Vuitton concerti uh, and, and Vuitton that they you know they adhere too strictly to the literal text they play classical composers but they cannot read between the lines so they just read what's on the page without any thought. They just repeat it. It's too literal. And he says, you have to understand what lies between the notes. And Brahms himself also understood the importance of that. But also he was always worried that if I write too much, we talked about this last week. If I write too much, then people will exaggerate. And he talks about, on the one hand, when he's conducting, uh, Brahms is conducting a new piece, a new symphony, a new concerto. He says, I put this quote in green, that in that case, I often cannot do enough pushing forward and holding back in order to produce more or less the passionate or calm expression I want. So what he's saying is he does exaggerate as a, as a performer when he's teaching the orchestra his new piece because he wants people to, to really understand. But he doesn't like to write it down he explains elsewhere because he doesn't want people to overdo it. So if you look at the second concerto, if you look at the G major violin sonata, you, you see in the autographs or in the corrected proofs, there's all kinds of little markings along the lines of poco sostenuto, poco piumoso, poco animato, things we talked about last week that he specifically told the publisher, I don't want them in the, in the first edition, you know, or in any edition. I don't want them published. This is just for teaching. This is just for explaining. But if, we, if I publish it, if it's part of the score, people will overdo it. And remember that discussion we had last week about the uh, Piu Lento. Uh, he changes it to Meno Allegro in the B major trio. Because again, he's heard for 45 years people overdoing it. And he's, he, he's tired of it. So he says, let's just do something that's going to be much more careful. So he's torn between those two, two, two things himself. Uh, so this idea of... Uh, Subtle tempo modification within a stable tempo, hugely important. And, and it seems that Brahms's conception was no different than these list of musicians I've put up here, which are just a few of the most important ones, uh, that tradition coming from Mendelssohn and Schumann. You see Felix there, you see Robert there, you see Clara there, uh, David, Karl Reinecke, and of course Joachim himself, and there are many others. But those are just some of the most important ones. Okay, so that's the tradition that we're talking about. Uh, how did that work, this tempo modification within a stable tempo? Uh, here is a beautiful ear witness uh, about Joachim, because uh, uh, Joachim lived quite a few, you know, 10 more years past Brahms, and uh, we are actually going to be able to hear a couple of his recordings. But first, I want to, I want to show you this, uh, uh, by this contemporary critic, uh, this idea about how Joachim's performance is free but more or less always within the within the regular pulse and he says the molding of his phrases consists of slight modifications of the strict values 
together with slight, notice that, slight variations of power, such as no marks of expression could convey. Elasticity, elasticity, elastic, is the word which best expresses the effect of Joachim's delivery of some characteristic themes. As in a perfect rubato, there is a feeling of resilience, of rebound in the sequence of the notes, a constant restoration of balance between pressure and resistance taking place as an India rubber ball resumes its original shape after being pressed, right? You press and it comes back. And he compares that to, to, to uh, uh, basically unmusical musicians who, he says, uh, suggest the same pressure when applied to a lump of dough. If you press a lump of dough, it doesn't come back. It just stays where it is. And that's where, that's how you know someone is not a great artist, as opposed to people like Joachim, who are. And more about his playing, people who heard him play, Moser says that he understood, that he says, like Mendelssohn, he understood how to connect from one theme to another without doing violence to the passage, okay, without ruining the whole, right? And another pupil says that when you studied with Joachim at the Hochschule in Berlin, that not only were you allowed this freedom from the beat, but if you did not take it, you were at first looked upon as a novice who required instruction, and later on, I love this, later on as an unmusical person whom it was not worth instructing, okay? Not worth instructing. So people are expected to understand how to take time, but it has to be subtle. So we have constantly the back and forth. In a minute, we're going to listen to, to Joachim's playing and see how this, how this really comes about. Uh, summing up this idea about the temple freedom, Karl Reinecke, important teacher, uh, a very good composer, by the way. Uh, some of you maybe have played his music. Uh, and uh, he says that there is a vast distance between obtrusive changes of tempo. Everybody know that word, obtrusive. Gets in the way. Uh, obtrusive. Between obtrusive changes of tempo and an imperceptible introduction of a faster or slower time, such as every sensitive artist will make a practice of at the proper place. And again, he talks about this exaggeration. <laughs> if you mark too much players, that's you guys, that's me, that's all of us interpreters, we'll do too much. We'll overreact. We'll do too much, and then that ruins it. So this, uh, Reinecke's, uh, uh a quote here sums it up very well. Okay, further elements of, of, of Brahms style. I've put up a few of them here for you. Of course, there's many more. But these are some ones that I thought we should address today. So, uh, first of all, instruments. Period instruments. Look, this is not as huge a difference as with Baroque. We think of period instruments as Baroque, and we think of Baroque bows, and we think about harpsichord. But still, uh, with, in Brahms's time, it's important to understand that there's gut strings on, the, on, on um, string instruments, which are much less powerful and, frankly, much more beautiful, uh, uh, much more gentle and, and soulful uh, than certainly a lot of the steel or even synthetic materials that are used today. The pianos are less powerful. Those iron frames aren't completely perfected yet. Uh, if perfected is the word, they certainly don't sustain the sound as much, especially in the bass. Even in Brahms's time, I'm not talking about forte pianos, I'm talking about Brahms's pianos. And of course, natural horn. The natural horn is the one that doesn't have the keys, right? It doesn't have keys, everything, all the pitch changes are done in the embouchure, in the lips, and a little bit with the hand in, inside the bell. And we know Brahms preferred the natural horn, its sweeter sound, to the more aggressive and, of course, more virtuosic uh, sound of the of the uh, valve horn. Uh, and he wrote a trio to prove that even uh, in 1864, the natural horn can do everything that a composer wants it to do. Let's hear a little bit of this opening of the horn trio on period instruments, natural horn, and also gut strings and uh, a piano from that time.
and a modern version. And notice how much vibrato the violinist is using. This is Itzhak Perlman, by the way. And we'll talk about vibrato a little bit later, but it's a very different approach. And of course, the instruments themselves. big difference in, in sound and the heavier piano and this horn beautiful horn playing but so so much bigger and so much again more aggressive that's what Brahms didn't like is that directness um, anyway the the, the 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 valve horn is an amazing instrument but Brahms wanted to show that you could write for the natural horn for the vault horn beautifully well um, now more about instruments you know I wanted to read you a little bit show you this inter interview with Andre Schiff one of my favorite colleagues and uh, just such a such a wonderful pianist and a wonderful mind and um you know schiff for a long time didn't wasn't interested in period instruments and uh but but he's coming around and i thought found this interview so interesting just want to show you a little bit of this and then listen to what he's talking about so this is with the new york times last year he says look but you were as recently as 20, 1990s you weren't even thinking about playing schubert on the forte piano and Schiff says, yes, I, I did say that, but I have to take it back. I was stupid. One has to be flexible and, and sometimes say I made a mistake. I was wrong. Okay, well, why was Brahms the next composer you decided to record in this historically informed way? And he talks about that it was the next step from Schubert. He was playing Schumann Concerto at Festival Hall in London, which is, if you've ever been there, it's a huge hall. It's difficult to project there. Uh, the sound tends to be uneven. And he says here, it's a very problematic hall. And he said, first time in my life playing the Schumann was absolutely without any problems. Not because of the hall, because he's playing with the orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, which of course is a wonderful period instruments orchestra. And he says, everything worked, the balance, the way the piano came across, it just worked. So he says, after the Schumann, let's try Brahms. Playing the Brahms concerti on a modern piano with modern orchestras, there were always balance problems which any of you who play the Brahms Concerti, you know, maybe you've started to play them, and you know it's a, it's a big issue. Uh, and the biggest problem is the conductor, uh, you know, has to be listening. But it's not just that, it's it's the size of the orchestra and the kinds of instruments. And and he says that uh, I found that uh, the physically and psychologically very hard to play, especially the B-flat. But with this Blutner piano that he's using in this recording, the piano from that time, the di physical difficulties disappear. The keys are a tiny bit narrower, that's really important. And the stretches are therefore not so tiring. And the action is much lighter, that's of course critical. The action is so much lighter. So there is not this colossal physical work involved, Schiff says. And the guy says, you achieve such a level of detail. And he says, that's the point, is to get that clarity which was been missing since about the 1930s. This is something really I want to emphasize today, that, that this idea about style, the style of Brahms and Joachim and all of those people at that time was still totally different from what it became in about, as Schiff says, the 20s and 30s. And then most of these recordings that, of the great German interpreters that we uh, grew up with, certainly in my generation, and actually I hope many, many of yours as well, but but we listen to them because they're great artists, uh, not so much because they know what they're really doing with style, because their style, and I'm going to talk about this a little later, was already so different from what Brahms and Clara and Joachim expected. 
So, so that will come up later. But anyway, Schiff says that, um, he, you know, he gives, he talks about this more, but, but this idea, he wanted to be clear and transparent. And yes, and he talks about the, that, also about sustained notes and how they need to be released. Not literally released, but need to be made less. And, and he says, same in Mozart, same in Beethoven, same in Brahms. Okay, so let's listen to uh, a little bit of the slow movement of the, actually, of the D minor concerto. And this is uh, uh, Andres Schiff just last year recording uh, on his on this Blutner piano and with the period instruments. And, and the piano sound is so interesting. And then the combination with orchestra. And you will see even in the big passage uh, that there's a certain airiness and a certain... Well, instead of talking, let's just hear it. Maybe not the most beautiful timbre of piano that we've ever heard, but uh, but 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 it has a it has a, a lightness and a beauty about it, nonetheless of a different kind. That's very instructive, and certainly that fantastic orchestra sound, big but not heavy. Uh, just by comparison, it's a more or less random uh, modern recording. Uh, this is uh, Christian Zimmerman and Leonard Bernstein. Vienna Philharmonic. Very different in all those aspects, and it's interesting how 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 much slower it also it, it, it is, and that's it seems to go part and parcel with instruments and with notions of style in general. 
And for me, I mean, I was just like, I don't know this recording really. I'm just kind of listening to it with you. And I'm thinking that uh, there's, you know, he has beautiful moments and beautiful ideas from Zimmerman. But um, it's hard for me to listen to that uh, after shift because I feel like it's it's exactly what we were talking about earlier. It's not really hanging together all that well because he stops for so long to point out this and then to point out this. And then does the whole have a, does it stick together? Uh, maybe not as well as the shift recording. Uh, so instruments, other areas of style, rhythm and articulation. Okay, here are just three quick areas to to bring your attention to. Um, okay, dotted rhythms. Uh, looking at this example of a famous Hungarian march, uh, they're, they're not expected to be played strictly. Uh, they're expected to have some kind of an underdotting or perhaps overdotting. Uh, not like in the Bach, where it's strictly with the triplet, but just a little bit of freedom. And that's something that here, perhaps the right hand and the left hand doesn't have to be exactly together as it would in a, um, in a, in a more standard piece. These are things that uh, are part of the style. Another example is two-note slurs, uh, not totally even. If you look at this Brahms sonata in D minor on the left side, well, okay, I hope you know it's not Brahms. That's a different B. Everybody plays that, Opus 31, number two. Okay, so Opus 31, number two, we all know that, da 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 right? Not exact. when we hear it played badly, it's when it's perfectly even um, in, terms of, in terms of dynamics and in terms of tempo. It should be a little bit, a little bit altered, that da 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 that two-note rhythm. And we see the same idea in a Brahms C minor quartet, uh, C, uh, string quartet, on the right side of the page in the first violin and then in the other strings. Same idea that it should not be played robotically or as Joachim said about those Belgian violinists, the Belgian school, you know, just kind of mindlessly looking at what's on the page instead of interpreting. Dots under a slur is the third example of, of uh, articulation issues must mean portato. Portato carried along, it's a long stroke. And that's discussed in this famous correspondence, again, between Brahms and Joachim, where Joachim put a slur, suggested a slur to indicate a bowing, two notes together, yup, bop, 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 in the finale of the concerto. And Brahms says, no, 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 you can't put dot, excuse me, a slur over dots, because that means portato, and portato means long. And they get into a discussion about that, and Brahms says, no. Says, this is, this is the way it's always been, not always, but for a, 150 years and he specifically says if it's good enough for Beethoven it's good enough for me okay that's that's that, that, I love that if it's good enough for Beethoven it's good enough for for Brahms okay and so I guess I'm suggesting to you if it's good enough for Brahms it's good enough for us for sure okay so this is just an example that amazing coda of the uh, opus one sonata all of that the first two lines portato the tenor line and the soprano the right hand, long articulation. Brahms tells us how important that is for him. Okay, other issues, hairpins. Okay, we all know, right, hairpins. That get louder, get softer. Of course, that's the primary definition, but for Brahms and for his contemporaries, it evidently meant something more and something more subtle at times. And specifically, pay attention, everybody. Specifically, it meant at times to adjust the speed of the beat. Very, very interesting and something we don't think about enough today. Slight hurrying or slight slowing down, slight lingering. This was well understood in Brahms's life and even before Brahms. 1828, Mendelssohn's sister, Fanny Mendelssohn, a beautiful composer and a beautiful musician, Fanny Hensel in her married life. She writes on one of her autographs. She says, the piece must be performed with much variation of tempo, but always gentle variation and without disorderliness. Same idea, without disorderliness. Don't go nuts. Be smart. And she says the hairpin signs stand for accelerando and ritardando. Interesting, right? So not just for crescendo and decrescendo. Um, they convey this subtle sense of rubato. Uh, 
list. Uh, actually look for a new type of notation. Look at the first edition of Au bord d'une source. This is Paris, 1841. You can see both pages, yes? Uh, hopefully you can see both pages on the screen. And look at the first page, the page on the left, and you can see on the second system this line above the F flat in the first bar. And he explains at the bottom that the double lines mean a crescendo of movement, meaning an in increase of speed. And the single line, like we're seeing here, is a decrescendo of movement, of speed. And then he even says that the double line means something uh, uh, less than a fermata, so like a tiny little breath. And so he's trying to actually use this different kind of notation, similar to hairpins, to indicate the slight the Chilorando, slight Bertrandando, also on page two, at the end of the second bar, and then into the third bar. That line, that's a new notation from Liszt. Now, obviously, this notation didn't really make it into, you know, normal music notation, even in Liszt's, Liszt's own life. But it's just interesting that they're trying to find another way to express something that, according to Brahms, really can't be expressed, uh, really on paper, but something musicians should know. Here is Fanny Davies, uh, a student uh, of Brahms, uh, uh, talking about uh, hearing him rehearse the C minor trio with Joachim. And she says that his manner of, of interpretation, this is Brahms's manner, was free, very elastic and expansive, but the balance was always there. One always felt the fundamental rhythms. I want to really focus on this, what I put in bold. The hairpin sign is used by Brahms, often occurs when he wishes to express great sincerity and warmth, applied not only to tone, but also to rhythm. So examples from early in Brahms's life, again, the Opus 1 Sonata, just look at those first four bars on this page. I so often hear this played just kind of exactly in tempo, and it, it needs to, these hairpins have to breathe. There has to be a little bit of something here. And then in the middle of his life, um, in the middle of his life, uh, second concerto, more or less in the middle, um, I want to show you a little bit here. This is a my own live version, but just to show you a little bit. Well, the hairpins are coming on the next page, but this just sets us up. Here are some of these hairpins. And uh, another example, Opus 118, the hairpin, this is late in his life now, the same idea, the hairpins are all over the place.
So just as a, to, to show you how these hairpins are not just volume, but can have that little bit of that rebound rubato effect within good taste. Vibrato is another area. Okay, yes, even pianists need to know something about this. You play the quartets and the quintet and trios and but with violins and cellos and violas, you need to know a little bit that uh, uh, the way that people kind of um, by default use vibrato today is very different uh, from that time. And 19th century treatises barely mention it, even as late as 1894, which is three years before Brahms' death, Schroeder says that only use it on particularly expressive notes. Don't just use it all the time. Joachim used very little vibrato. We're going to hear that uh, now in this uh, box another. Okay, the, the sound quality is not great, but please just uh, listen to what's underneath the quality, the, the sound quality, which is amazing artistry. So pure and virtually no vibrato compared to what we would hear today. Here is an example, even in the Hungarian dance style. This is, by the way, Joachim's transcription, of course, of Brahms, but there's not much vibrato here. And it's a pretty amazing playing in so many ways in terms of, well, just listen. Okay, so let's let's move on. Uh, vibrato for string players, pedaling for us. Uh, Brahms doesn't indicate pedal frequently, unlike Chopin and Liszt and Schumann, but like Mendelssohn, he uses it very rarely uh, indicated in his works, but of course, we're expected to use it all the time, much of the time, but with good taste and carefully. Um, I want to emphasize that this uh, kind of overpedaling disease that grips so much of modern piano playing, it's not coming from Brahms's time. Certainly it's not coming from Beethoven and Mozart's time. It's coming from not even the earliest age of romantic pianists. I want to quickly show you, this is not Brahms, but nonetheless, I want to hear, show you a couple of the earliest recorded pianists to see what they're doing. Listen to how carefully they pedal, how lightly they pedal. This is a piece you all know, and this is a pianist you all know.
Well, there's so much to hear in there uh, and an incredible playing and a little bit funny rhythms there, but um, uh, fantastic stuff. And you hear how light it is. And another example, one of the earliest titans of the piano, really an amazing pianist, Rosenthal, uh, also a, a, a big Chopin piece. Just think about how you hear this piece played now and maybe how you how you pedal it yourself if you play it and just I just want you to hear it another way, which was the standard way until the 1920s 1930s. So just to give you an idea that that's an again I didn't have to look hard for these recordings these aren't anything unusual this is how people played uh, and uh, now back to our theme how did how did pianists who knew Brahms pedal we have some recordings that are really revelatory not just for the pedaling for many reasons but I want you to hear before we finish um, just a couple of these three or four if we have time just little snippets this is actually the first guy who made recordings. The first pianist to make recordings is Grunfeld, born in 1852. So he's only 19 years younger than Brahms. So this is the last, uh, the A-flat major. I wanted to hear more of it, but I don't, I'm trying to stay on time. So another pianist is Ilona Eibenschutz. She was a favorite student of Clara, played for Brahms all the time, lived very long. She lived until like the 1960s. So, uh, you know, which is quite recent if you think about it. And uh, so here is Eibenschutz playing Opus 117, number two. Here is Adelina de Lara. What a beautiful name. But it's, she actually was English over that beautiful, exotic, uh, you know, Latin sounding name. Um, also was a favorite of Brahms. He loved her playing. Let's listen. Not sure I love her playing as much as the others, but in any case, you know, who knows with these old recordings and, you know, the recordings were so difficult to make. In any case, I'm showing it to you primarily here for the pedaling. And um, maybe one more, Etelka Freund. This is variations 11 and 12. So transparent.
Okay, so very, very instructive. Let's sum up what we discussed today. Elements of Brahms style. I'm not saying this is everything, and I'm not saying this is all definitive, but I'm trying to just sum up the best knowledge that we have. Elasticity of tempo. Elastic, but never exaggerated. Maybe the most important thing to keep in our minds when we play Schumann, Mendelssohn, Brahms, all of this music. Hairpins can indicate more than just dynamics. It can indicate slight variation in tempo, slight variation in tempo. Period instruments can reveal a more transparent texture. Look, I don't often play them myself, but I find it so helpful to keep in mind that aesthetic, and that quality. So whether or not you play them, whether or not you play only on big modern Steinway monsters, keep in mind what we just heard from Schiff, for example, as what Brahms would have been listening for. Articulation and rhythm, to sum it up, it follows classical precedent. If you know how to articulate and to deal with slurs and with Portato in Haydn and Beethoven, you know how to do it in Brahms. He doesn't want anything different. The vibrato for the strings, pedaling for the piano, must not be overdone, must be tasteful. Not to mention clean and clear harmonically, but tasteful. Finally, notation more broadly. More broadly, just when we look at a score. Last week we talked about read carefully what's on, on the page. But today we're talking about, okay, we know what's on the page, but now we have to go beyond that. Don't be like those uh, Belgian violinists that Joachim was so appalled at, that just literally read what's on the page, know what's on the page, but then read between the lines, between the lines, as Joachim said. Okay, before we disperse, I want to remind you, and a couple of you were missing last week, we have a mystery assignment for this class. First of all, each one of you is assigned one of the major piano works of Brahms. All of them, except the cadenzas and exercises and little pieces. Okay, this is a big one for me. You know that you must use Henley edition. In this case, there's no other good urtext. Uh, typically, Baron Ryder is starting to publish some. You must get it physically from the library. There's plenty of copies of each of these pieces. Or use the Henley app. Curtis provides it for free on your iPad. I think most of you have iPads, so that's another great option. Okay, the exact nature of your assignment is yet to be revealed. Okay, but I do promise you, you won't be asked to practice or perform. So don't lose sleep. I know you have graduation recitals and different kinds of projects, so this is not meant to add to your burdens. Okay, but um, you'll be asked to do something. Please read your score at the piano. Read through these pieces. Read them away from the piano. Okay, and especially look for interesting details that echo what we discussed, what we discuss in all these classes. Okay, so what's actually in these scores. Assignment for next week. Bring your score, please. Bring your Henley score to class. If you haven't got it yet, you have one more week to get yourself organized, to go to the library or to use the app. Bring your score and show me. Next week is in person. Okay, I expect to see it Tuesday, April 5th. Okay, so in case you forgot, here are the assignments. We just went in seating order. Whoever was seated, we went one, two, four, five, nine, and we went that way through by opus number. And so these are the assignments from last week, which those of you who were there already know. Okay, but we have five question marks. So how is that going to work? The remaining works are going to be revealed right now. Um, I can do the two Rhapsody. Um, uh, no, you will see that they've already been pre-assigned, and maybe you can figure out how. I need gets Opus 79. Somebody tell her, please, since she's not here. Young 116. Act 117. Nobody 
教书。118. All right, and Zitong gets 119. Okay, so can you figure out how I carefully assigned these remaining five pieces? Alphabetical order. Okay, so it's just as random as last week. The last five pieces went in alphabetical order to the people who didn't get them. Okay, so. Again, if you your friend, you know whoever is friends with whoever, let them know please about these pieces, and ask them to bring them next week. Uh, guys, very good. Uh, enjoyed being with you as always, and I will see you next week. I think for seminar and then also for uh, this course in person. Have a good night and enjoy your Brahms and enjoy all of your music. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.